We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and this uh, chapter is about divisions in the wild. Say divisions. So divisions in the wild, and here's what happens. And here's what happened. These people had developed mascots. They had started putting personality as something that was super important. They had let politics become the guide for how they related to each other in the church. And so this book is not just how it relates to you, but this book is how it relates to us because it was a book written for churches to hear. So the letter would come, 1 Corinthians, and they would sit down, everybody would listen, and they'd read it. And so that's how Paul was pastoring this church um, and helping this church back in that day. And so, um, you know, Paul rolled into Corinth. We read about it last week in Acts 18. He, 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 he worked for a year and a half. He was able to go full-time when people brought him money from other churches. He had given his life to help these people. And uh, we don't know how big the church was, but most scholars say the church was like 50 or 60 people. So it's jacked up, people. There's 50 or 60 of them. You got people getting drunk at communion, a guy dating his mom. You've got uh, them visiting temple prostitutes. You got all this kind of crazy stuff happening in a little church of 50 or 60 people. It was church in the wild. And, uh, you know, I've heard really hyper-religious people say, if we could just get back to the first century church, if we could just get back to the early church, well, the early church was jacked up. And I'm not looking for a time machine. I'm looking for to establish Jesus Christ in hearts right now. Welcome, Southside. We're linked together by the amazing technology of fiber optics. Give it up for one church in multiple locations. The church has always been jacked up because jacked up people come here. The church has always been a family, and you have crazy uncles, and I have crazy uncles, but they're still a part of my family. And so Paul is writing letters to clean up these messes. He wrote four or five letters. We only have two because I think the other three weren't divinely inspired. Paul was so upset, it just Jesus couldn't endorse it. <laughs> the word of God could not be endorsed through that. But he, he had uh, uh, four or five letters and two visits to try to fix these jacked up people. And that just shows us that even the godliest leaders can have moments of frustration where they're not totally guided by the Spirit. And that's why we don't have five letters to Corinth, just two. Um, and, and, and there's a, something that we need to get from this. People say, well, I'm just looking for a good church. I just want to find a good church. That's not going to happen. There are no good churches. Churches are full of bad people. I'm a bad person. You're a bad person. We're all bad people. And so there's not like an idealized version of the church. We are all sinners saved by grace. We all need the continual work of the Spirit of God in our hearts to change us because if that's not happening, we go into something other that's not good, okay? So he starts off this letter, and uh, here we go. It's verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 1. Paul called by the will of God, say will of God, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. I think that's so funny that Sosthenes is now with him because last week I told you Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, became a Christian, leaving the synagogue, the Jewish church, without a pastor. And then Paul evidently converted Sosthenes as well. So they're having a crisis of leadership at the old synagogue uh, there. So anyway, um, Paul is writing here and he's saying something from the very beginning because he wanted them to understand that he had authority that needed to be recognized. And I haven't preached on spiritual authority in quite some time, but this text demands it. And here's why he needed to establish spiritual authority, because this group of people were very talented and very disobedient. They were very gifted and very disobedient. They were very skilled and very disobedient. And, um, you know, the Corinthians didn't really want order. They wanted the right to pick and choose. And that's not how it goes. Like when it comes to what Jesus has done, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes but the Father by me. And so you can't say, well, I want the way, but I don't want the truth, and I really would like the life. No, you get all of it. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and so you can't pick and choose. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. And so um, because they were picking and choosing, this church had developed, these 50 or 60 people had developed into cliques, groups with mascots, and they were all kind of warring against each other. And um, the good news, though, with all this and their bad behavior was that they were still considered to be a part of the church. Like, God doesn't exclude us over our bad behavior. The church is a hospital, and you know what? It's okay to bleed at the hospital. If you're going to bleed somewhere, bleed at the hospital, you know? And I, 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 I shaved my face the other morning, and I, you never, ladies don't understand, maybe some of you do, but most of you don't. When you're shaving your face, 
man, I, got, I cut myself like right there. And there's certain places on your face when you cut it, they're going to bleed and bleed and bleed. And so I had to pray over the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm bleeding out on my face. My like, God, it's okay to bleed at the hospital, but I ain't going to be at no hospital. I need you to heal me right now. Hallelujah. Anyway, last minute, it stopped bleeding. But man, it's not okay to bleed some places, but it's okay to bleed at the hospital. And so messed up people, jacked up people, make the church. But the Corinthians were acting like they had a monopoly on, on decisions and God. And Paul starts writing to me. He's like, all right, just so everybody knows, I'm here to regulate, and I am called by the will of God. I'm not some guy. Now, um, there must be spiritual leadership in the church. There must be spiritual leadership in the church because people disagree on everything, and somebody needs to come in dressed amazingly in all black and be like, ball, strike, <laughs> walk. Like, and sometimes, you know, leaders have to be umpires to say, I'm not playing the game. I'm just saying that's out of bounds. And so um, spiritual leadership is chosen by God. And churches make mistakes when choosing pastors when they turn it into beauty contests. Now, I would never win a beauty contest, but I'm certainly called of God to Springfield. Like when I sweat, it smells like cashew chicken. Like, like I won't go into a Cabela's even though Bass Pro owns it because I'm so loyal. When Renee and I are having mommy daddy time, I get close to her and say, Oh, 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 Riley's. She loves, I'm just so Springfield because I'm called to this city and I'm called to this church. Hired hands quit when the work, when the wolf comes and the work comes. Like hired hands run when the money's not good. Hired hands give up and quit when things aren't going well. But somebody who's called will do things for Jesus they'd never do for money. The church needs to say, yeah. And so I'm called to this church. I'm called to this city. And uh, we, don't, we don't hire talent, we hire heart. And so the average pastoral tenure is three years. I have been the pastor of this church for 15 years, I've been here for 20 years. I've been through all kinds of stuff, but I am committed to be here, and my interests aren't really what I serve. I serve the interests of the Word of God and the heart of God versus my own self-interests. If this was my own self-interest that I was serving, things would be a lot different around here. <laughs> That's not what this is about, okay? And so we have many years invested, much sacrifice, and so we understand spiritual authority here. It's not something that we, we use flippantly or frequently, but there's times I've had to look at people and say, if you lie to me right now, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. I like to start with something funny. <laughs> like if you lie to me, you're lying to the Holy Spirit because I'm not doing my work. I'm doing God's work, and that's how our pastors are. And so um, we have to understand that God calls people. And good spiritual leadership does not point you to themselves. Good spiritual leadership says, let me point you to Jesus. And so we understand spiritual authority in the church. That's why leaders don't go rogue. That's why you do what we're doing. And so when people go rogue, they don't lead. I love you. My name is Tyler. I'm your friend. But we don't have rogue leaders here. They cease to be leaders and they become worshipers when that happens because it's just not a joke. Like, I'm not up here for my health. I'm doing this because of the high calling that God has given me for this city, for this season, for this church, for this season, for this vision, for this season. And I didn't come to play any games about that, okay? And so obedience means, don't clap, that was just too tough. I'm talking tough up here. Obedience means if a authority that God has placed in your life asks you to pursue marriage counseling, you don't run away from it, you run to it. You smell that? You smell that? I'm making everybody smell it this morning. And so, and so the Bible tells us that spiritual leadership is no joke, and it's a, it's a heavy thing, because Hebrews 13 and 17 says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account like, stand before God and say about their experiences. Let them do this with joy, not with a groaning, like, I don't know. They took the whole summer off. <laughs> uh, I want to back her up tonight. <laughs> Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then it says, verse 18, pray for us, for, we sure, for we're sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. So the Corinthian church had become a big burden for Paul. And here was the problem in Corinth. They wouldn't listen to anybody. They wouldn't listen to anybody. Paul had worked among them for a year and a half. 
He didn't, he didn't gain any money from them. He, he paid his own way. He made tents for a while. And when it came time for Paul to tell them what to do, they said, ah, you're just an old guy with a lot of opinions. We're going to do what we want. And Paul's like, oh, no, you ain't. Like he planted the church. He baptized the converts. He trained the leaders. He helped them all along the way. And they looked at him like, why should we listen to you? That is, that is, that is a problem. Because it says here that they were, uh, well, let's just read what the Bible says. Verse 2, to the church of God that's at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You're called to be a saint. You're not called to be an outsider. You're called to be a saint. Called to be saints together with all those who in every place, that's us. So this book was to them, but it's also to us. Because to us, because it says to those who are in every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, both their Lord and ours. Okay? He had to remind them that they didn't have a monopoly on their relationship with God. He had to remind them that they were a part they were a part of a larger whole. They weren't just a lowercase c church. They were a part of the big C, capital C church, okay? And so, you know, they were jacked up. And God wants us to build a church with jacked up people in it. God wants us to build a church at the gate of hell. God does not want us to become, you know, uh, isolated from our community and our society and start monasteries and all this. Like, we can't be surprised that the world we live in is full of sin and it's messed up. We have to be willing to engage that. And so the problem here was they, they were set up that way, but then they started becoming like the city. When it was temple prostitute time, like, all right, let's go. Woo! Temple prostitutes. It's time to date our moms. I'm down for dating my mom. It's time for some alcohol. Let's get katoinked. That means drunk in case anybody's not keeping score at home. And so Christians were come, becoming like the city, okay? And so Paul um, was using the authority of leadership to help heal the problems and bring them to unity. The first thing Paul wants them to know is, hey, this people, hey, wake up. This church is God's church. This church belongs to God. And that seems obvious, but in Corinth, they were fighting that. They were thinking it was a man's church. It was their church. The single people thought it was their church. The married people thought it was their church. The rich people thought it was their church. The poor people thought it was their church. The people who spoke in tongues said, Rosoha, it's my church. The people that didn't speak in tongues said, it's our church. <laughs> like, it's, it's in 1 Corinthians 11. All, everybody is contending for their own way. They're all fighting over everything. They had broken up into groups and factions with agendas, the married, the single, the rich, the poor, the Jews and the Greeks, the educated and the uneducated were all trying to get what they wanted. And uh, they would all be like, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? We're wrong when our beliefs conquer our love for our brother or our sister. We must not let this happen. When we love to prove people wrong and prove ourselves right, we have a love problem. When we develop an us versus them mentality, we have a love problem. When we, when we, when we play zero-sum games where what I win, you lose, we have a love problem. We have a population of people in a society now that is constantly at war with itself, each side deeply believing that the other side is evil, wrong, and cannot be tolerated. And this creates constant anxiety and constant distraction. And it's the perfect conditions for an outside force to capitalize on us. We know this, united we stand, divided we fall. Hello, it's a church and a nation as well. So he goes on to say, who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is saying, look, it's God's church. Quit contending for what you want and ask this question, God, what do you want for your church? Because I may not trust them, but I trust you. I've had to do that over and over again with people. Like, I've not been, when it comes to uh, spiritual things, I maybe not haven't been, maybe not haven't been, there have been times I've not been fathered well and I couldn't trust people in my life and I had to say, God, if I'm wrong, chasten me like a son because I trust you even if I don't trust them. And so you've got to find spiritual leadership that you trust because the death of every church is when people start showing up with their agenda saying, you do this or we're going to fight. You do this or I'm going to leave. You do this or we're going to split this thing. You do this or I'm going to make it brutal. Everybody needs to walk in and say, God, this is your church. What do you have for us collectively? We need to accept the fact that the church belongs to God and it doesn't belong to us. 
It doesn't belong to leaders. It definitely doesn't belong to a denomination or a non-denomination. Ultimately, churches belong to God, and it's God's church. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died for the sins of his people. Jesus rose again to forgive us and to give us power to overcome. He brought us together, called us a family, put us in the church. It's his church, and it has to be that way. And the church said yes. And so it's easy to find fault with God's church. How many of you know a woman? Raise your hand. That's not bad. Most of you do. You don't go up to a woman and say, I've been noticing you're getting a little bit of a muffin top. Right? There's several reasons why you don't. But a main reason is because she has already noticed it before you pointed it out. Right? You don't go up and point out the muffin top. You don't go out to a dude and say, well, I noticed you've got an extra chin you're growing. He knows it mostly, unless he's got a beard to cover it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like uh, when my mom is struggling, I don't say, ha, 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 ha. look at her struggle, <laughs> and I go help. When my wife can't reach something, I don't be like and say, well, it must suck to be short. <laughs> I go help and show her my amazing reach. <laughs> because when there's a problem, I don't want to be the one that stands back and points at it and criticizes. I want to be the one that says, you know what, I'm invested in this. I want to help. So the bride of Christ doesn't need its muffin top pointed out. It needs people that serve it, work to help it, and make it better. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so funny. Verse 4 is so funny when you look at it closely. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, it makes me so thankful that God puts up with people like you. <laughs> Ouch. It makes me feel so thankful that God puts up with people like me. Verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. All right, now he starts talking about how talented and how capable they were in verse five. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. You're great talkers. You're smart people. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So that you're not lacking in any gift. You're very gifted. You're very talented. You're very smart. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse eight, who will sustain you to the end? Get us in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse nine. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. What Paul first reminds them of is not where they're messing up, and we're going to get to that, but he speaks to their right position with God. He speaks to their right position with God before he speaks to their problems. And that's how we have to do. We have to speak to potential over problems. We have to speak to people's right standing with God before we try to address their issues. People, you're a part of the family of God. As jacked up as you and I may be, we're a part of the family of God. Now, because you're a part of the family, let's do what families do and talk about what we need to talk about. All right. He's saying, uh, he's also telling them this. Don't, just, 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 just remember that God has been and God will be faithful to you in your messed up self. When you're messed up, God will be faithful to you. When you're not doing well, God will be faithful to you. And, and also he's saying that God has no regrets when he called you. Like God's not getting that, you know, you know that, you know that tattoo, no regrets. Come on, no regrets. Like God has no regrets about calling you. All right, now we come to the payoff. Verse 10. And Paul has given them some compliments. And now comes the punch to the gut. Are we ready? I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, unity is not at the cost of truth. Okay? We don't compromise truth in life or truth in this book just so we can be unified. Many times people think unity and tolerance above, it's not above, it's not above everything. Jesus and his truth and his word has to be first and foremost. And when we elevate unity above truth, we're not operating as faithful believers at all, okay? 
But here's what Paul's trying to do. 10 times in 10 verses, he says, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, 10 times. He's trying to get them focused off their pet issue and focused back on Jesus. He's calling them to repentance, okay? And so the Greek word for divisions there is very interesting. I studied it in a bunch of different experts and it means like a tear, but it also has a political nature to it. It also has a political nature to it. So, I mean, election season's coming. Y'all wear me out. You post things without thinking who it might affect or how it might affect them. You, you, you assume because you've thought about something, you understand it fully and you don't. The best thing you can do is operate in love and not operate in all the things I just talked about, which are binary thinking, I win, you lose, zero-sum games. Our love is really tested in our nation right now, and many of us just throw our hats in the culture war ring and say, they're all right and they're all wrong. And you know what? You're all wrong for thinking that. Don't clap. Don't clap. I don't want to be up here by myself. I don't need a bunch of people clapping right now. It's, just let me do my thing. And I'm not mad at you for clapping. I love you. I'm Tyler. I'm your friend. But many scholars said there that the church was getting political and uh, God has never demanded uniformity in the church. Like God has never demanded for us to all be the same, but he wants us to have the same heart. He wants us to be invested in the family of God. Like the big issue here, John Calvin said, was one of partisanship. They had developed partisanship in God's house. He goes on, okay, in verse 11, he says, for it's been reported to me by Chloe's people, thank God for Chloe's people. Sometimes it takes somebody coming forward and say, yo, we got a problem over here. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, there, be, there are quarrelings among you, my brothers. Notice he reminds them they're in the family, my brothers, you're quarreling, okay? Now, an amazing viral video took place this week. I don't have the time to show you all of it, but a young man that attended our church several years ago got told what's up by a grandfather in traffic, Republic Road in Kansas. I have just 20 seconds of the video here. Evidently, there was a traffic altercation, and I'd like to show you what happened. Young man with tattoos decided he was going to have it out with Grandpa in the street. Grandpa said, no, you ain't. Put him on the ground, went up, said, now, I'd like to invite you to the Courageous Church where you can learn more about Jesus. And then he turns on his heel and walks away smartly. Yes. 250,000 views this week in Springfield. Give it up, folks. We are killing it out there. Now put the picture up here, okay? Here's what our society is wanting to have happen. They want to put older against younger. They want to put tattooed against not tattooed. They want to put black against white and hats versus no hats. I had people write me angry emails about hats in church one time. Loafers versus sneakers. Dockers versus jeans. They want to put us in the position of, sit down, young blood. I love that. I found this on the internet. But that is what is happening in our society where our differences cause us to quarrel rather than try to learn more about each other. And after they fought it out, they were kind of like talking back and forth like, hey, that was great. Yeah, we really, yeah, blah, blah, blah. He says, my brothers, you're quarreling. He says, it, my brothers, you're quarreling. And so here's how they were quarreling. Verse 12, what I mean is that each one of you says, well, I'm following Paul. And another one says, well, I'm following Apollos. And another one says, well, I'm going to follow Cephas. And another says, well, I'm going to follow Christ. All of this is so wrong. Even the people that said, I follow Christ. You know why? Because they are putting Christ at the same level as all these other jokers, and that wasn't good. Jesus is not like anything else. He's his own thing. Your allegiance needs to be solely to him. He's not comparable to anything else. Then you've got the super hyper-religious types that say, well, I only follow Jesus, and so you can't tell me nothing. Can't nobody tell me nothing. That's not what this is about, okay? You don't, you, you, you don't have such a close relationship with Jesus that nobody can say, you know what, you're out of bounds. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't God good to us? Isn't God so gracious to us? Like, like nobody is so right that they can't be told, hey, you need to work on your marriage. Nobody is so right that they can't say, you know what, you're, 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 the way that you're running your finances is just not God's best. Like, we're just like the Corinthians because can't nobody tell us nothing. That's from Old Town Road. Come on, somebody. 
And so then they started having popularity contests. Well, I like that one, but I don't like that one. Well, I like live, but I don't like video. Oh, woo, I just stepped in it. Let me get that off my foot. Seriously, am I the pastor or am I not? I mean, I'm going to be. <laughs> we, we don't play with this kind of division where I like that one, but I don't like this one. I love it when he... No, it's okay to have preferences. But when you start creating factions, mascots, and popularity contests in the church, it's time to repent. Amen, pastor. Preach on. I think I will. Paul then doesn't attack or defend any one of those four groups. He, he, he just wants them to know that they should not be forming dependencies on people and ideologies and the gift sets of people. Listen, the problem was the cross was being forgotten and clever rhetoric and fancy public speaking was being elevated at Corinth. They thought because somebody could talk good, they were good. They thought because somebody, Paul said, I did not come to you with enticing speech and, and eloquence. He said, I came to you in the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so, and so don't let somebody's wonderful words make you think that somehow your faith is dependent on them because people fall all the time. The division groups had mascots and they stopped listening to each other and they started talking at each other. And in talking at each other, those 50 or 60 people in that church were able to tick everybody off and they didn't even have Facebook to do it. It was an amazing feat. Come on, somebody. And so then, because they were divided, Paul wants to get it right in verse 13 and he asks him a question, is Christ divided? Like, did you get, did you get a portion of Jesus when you got saved? Did, 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 did you get like a, a half a slice of Jesus? Did you get a, 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 a half cup of Jesus? No, when you gave your life to Jesus, he gave you everything. You got all of Jesus. And so the, the answer there is Jesus doesn't just love a few people. Jesus is, is for everybody. Like, we don't own Jesus. Our thinking can't be superimposed on Jesus. My thinking can't be superimposed on Jesus. He is not our possession. I am his possession. And so no single group, no matter the city, no single group has a monopoly on Jesus. Their view of Christianity was messed up. They made it into a club or an institution, and Christianity is Jesus. And so we got to get back to the cross. We've got to make it about our Savior. Good leaders point you to Jesus. And so there is diversity in the church, and there needs to be diversity in the church. We need diversity without division in the church because the church was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so everybody has to be aware. Everybody has to be mature because here's what Corinth did. They all got along till Paul left, and it blows up. Like, I love that you love the leaders in our church. And it's okay to have preference. Like, I know everybody loves to hear me preach and sing. I mean, I know it. But you're going to have to get with these other people who sing. <laughs> Honestly, though, like, we need, it's okay to have preferences, but it's not okay to have prejudice. And so they were making a big deal about who baptized them. And Paul's like, stop it. It doesn't matter who baptizes you. He's like, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, obviously not. They're baptized in the name of Jesus. But they were all tied up. Oh, well, Peter baptized me and Cephas baptized me and Paul baptized me. <laughs> He's like, what's wrong with you? Who baptizes you doesn't matter. What matters is what you're baptized unto. It's unto Christ, and that's what we're doing today. We're baptizing people. He goes on to say, I'm going to skip to verse 18. Um, well, I'm going to read 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He didn't say baptizing wasn't important. He's just saying I, others can baptize. I'm here to preach. And not with words of eloquent wisdom. Because the Corinthians had all these eloquent speakers that were causing them to have their allegiance swayed from what God had set up. And God set Paul as an apostle over that church. <laughs> and he said, lest the cross be emptied of its power. So it may sound good, but if it doesn't bring you back to Jesus, it's not good. Amen. So, um, it goes on to say, verse 18, for the message or the word of the cross 
It's folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. That's the antidote to self-centered factions in the church. Unity is not unison. We've got to learn how to degree, disagree agreeably along the way. To think, well, my group is more spiritual than yours, or I have insight that you don't have, or I'm holier than you. One of the terrible things in the church I grew up in was spiritual elitism. Like, we're the, real, we're the Navy SEAL Christians, and they're just the enlisted Christians. It ain't that way. We're all a part of the family of God, and faith is the basis that puts you in the family, period. And so, you know, many people think that the power of God is going to work from their strength and their intellect and their actions and their deeds and the strategies. They're just wasting their time. Corinth was wasting their time with that. The power of God comes through what Jesus did on the cross for us. And uh, they made a mistake of thinking that Paul was an orator just like all the other orators. They, they, they lost their understanding of authority along the way. And uh, Paul wrote this to reframe those categories and get them right to where they could be helped and they could grow. But here's the thing that you need to understand. I know it's hard to trust. For many of you, it's hard to trust me. It's hard to trust my voice. I get it. But when you can't trust anything else, you can trust Jesus. And Jesus helps with everything else. Because here's what he said in verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He's saying, you can believe what you want, but I'm going to win in the end. That's what he's saying here. You can, I, I'm not going to allow fanciness of speech to destroy what this should really be built on, which is the cross. Verse 20. And then he says, hey, where is the one who is wise? Where's all the smart people you've been following? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? He's saying it sounds good, but ultimate riches and truth are found in Jesus. And God spoke something pretty strong to me that I need to say to you while I was studying this. And I don't typically preach like this, but it's in the book, and so we're doing it. Uh, I prefer to preach things that make me and you happy. But God spoke to me, and I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, tell my children that that podcast that's their favorite is not their pastor. And we adopt all the voices that are out there. And all that's good. I praise God that you're, you're gleaning and growing and, 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 and feeding and all that. But if God plants you in a local house, then you need to understand there's a concept of authority that what God puts in your life has for you that a podcast doesn't have for you. Welcome to the Courageous Church. So, we can get drunk on human wisdom. The Corinthians were drunk on human wisdom. And they never stop and ask the question, what does the book say? What does the book say? What is the heart of God for this? What does Jesus say about it? The wise, the writer, those that love debate, their best efforts are foolish. And we need to repent. Every location, south and north, every service, preach the same way there as I did here. We need to repent of worldly wisdom, of contending for individual mascots at the expense of the cross in our life. It says this, as musicians come for sins in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach. He's like, yeah, you've got some fancy speakers among you, but you may think that what I'm doing isn't at their level, but God will use the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This is strong. I mean, Paul is not pulling punches here. He's letting them have it. And then he says, you know, there's, there's divisions. He's like, for the Jews want it this way, and the Greeks want it this way, but we're just going to give them Christ anyway. Verse 23. Let me read it to you, starting at 22. The Jews demand signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, and that's a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, but to those who are called, both of us, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so whatever your background, whatever you think about the world, there are answers beyond self and human wisdom in God. And he says in verse 25, for the foolishness, say foolishness, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We better depend on God. 
Look, God's called us to, as a church, live in a unique space in our city. And that requires something of you. That requires you to seek God first. God has called us to represent something other, something unique, something life-giving, joyful, and unified. That requires something of all of us, which means that not one of us has the right to get drunk on human wisdom. We have to seek God. And what I have known, and this is, this is true, um, throughout the course of years and much time invested, God cares for his church and God protects his church and God guides his church and God puts things in order in his church as they need to be in order. And so my confidence is in the cross and my confidence is in him. And the appropriate response to this word for us is to search our own hearts and to ask the question, have I been, have I been lawless in my own heart and spirit? Have I let my actions work against love? Have I assumed that my knowledge was superior to the knowledge of Christ? Have I in some way developed this thinking of, of, of mascots and popularity contests and preferences as my guide? That can't be the case. This is about Jesus. If it's not about Jesus, we got nothing. We got nothing to help anybody with. We got nothing to help you with. But if it's about Jesus, it's limitless. Amen, somebody.